of you this morning, those watching us by way of the internet, we pray that God will bless your heart, that you minister to you by His Spirit. Father, we thank you. Holy Spirit, you have your will. You do what no man can do. Bless, rebuke, encourage, heal, deliver by the power of the word. To you be praised, to you be glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, if, if you read from Luke, now um, the theme is obedience provides protection. Obedience provides protection. Now, if you read uh, um, Luke, if you read the book of Luke, Luke 6, 47 to 49. I think it's from 45. Wait, where the, um, is it 45? 46. It said, why call me Lord, Lord? Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Or you do not do what I say. Or you do not do what I say. So he comes to verse 7, 47. He says, Anyone who comes to me, whoever comes to me, and hear my word, and do them. He continues, he says, He is like a man. He is compared to a man who built his house now we see in these three verses right Jesus presents a picture of two men who build homes and we will and there was a time of storm the storm did come. Now, one thing we should be assured of ourselves is that no matter who you are, no matter the color of your skin, no matter your geographical location, no matter your nationality, no matter how spiritual you may be, there is a day of storm. There will always be storm. As long as you are in this life, there will always be storm. Storm is unavoidable. It is not as inevitable. The only way you can avoid storm unless you are not in this life. So the two you talk about two men who build a house and storm came. One collapsed while the other stood firm. And of course, this is not a strange story to a lot of believers, a lot of you know, a lot of us. And although most Christians are aware of this story, they're very much aware, but most Christians do not really uh, know what separates the wise man from the foolish man. They have not come to understand the separation. And, and for them, it's for some, it seems to indicate that, that he was wise because he was a Christian. Whereas the foolish man represented not Christian. At least I have some people understand it. That, that, that's, that's not a basis. That's not even a fact. Because it is a foolish man who says in his heart, there is no God. And it is a missing the foolish for a person to trust in their eternal destiny in some theory and some good works. Most people do less research as to get to heaven than they do on how many uh, 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 cats are in are in are in the the, 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 the you know the chalk bar that you buy. You know how many 
gas or sugar in it, chamba. But that is foolish, of course. But that is not the difference between the wise and the foolish man in the passage. It's not because one is Christian, one is not a Christian. No, that's not the reason. But still, there are others who seem to distinguish between the wise man from the foolish man as the wise man owns so many Bibles. He has a stack of Bibles in his house. And the foolish man does not have a Bible. That's not even a reason. But having Bibles is not, does not make anybody wise. If you have Bibles, it doesn't make you wise. It does nothing good, it doesn't make you wise. And there are some who recognize that it is enough to have a Bible sitting on your shelf. Your library is surrounded with Bibles and concordances. Or several Bibles. And they believe that the difference between the wise man and the foolish man is that the wise man has knowledge, has Bible knowledge. That the wise man, whereas the foolish man basically um, is ignorant and illiterate biblically. Again, it, it, it in no way says that's the difference. That's the one that's not what this is then. That. that is not a difference between the wise and the foolish man in the passage. The passage doesn't say, you know, that the wise man, you know, um, he knows the Bible, he quotes the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and the foolish man doesn't even know one scripture reference. No. That is not what difference she is then. What is the difference? between the wise and the foolish man. The answer is fine, verse 27, obviously. Obviously, it's fine, verse 47. What does 47 say? It says, whosoever comes to me. Now, it is saying, the wise man come to me, or the foolish. No, it said whosoever, which be anybody, 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 whosoever comes to me and hear my words and does them, and does them. So you see, in the text, Jesus provides a three descriptive actions. Three descriptive actions. Number one, the man must come. Number two, the man must hear. And the most important, number three, the man must do. The man must come. So let's look at the aspect of coming to Jesus. Because first thing he says, he said, whosoever comes. How important it is. Now Jesus was given a spiritual issue, but he was not written it from a physical example. So today, he's not asking us to go and build a physical house. Even today, of course, there's been some people who will build, you know, houses, maybe because of finances, but they will build houses less strong foundation. But today, he's not asking us to build as a house. So the first thing he says, whosoever comes to me, so the first action is coming to Jesus. 
coming to Jesus. And, and coming to Jesus will probably refer to us daily. Referring to coming up to Jesus, coming to Jesus daily. In our daily lives, we must come to him as his disciples. Jesus said in, 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 in Luke 9, 23, he says that if anyone will come after me, that person must first take up his cross daily and follow. Now the question is, are you coming after Jesus every single day? Are you coming after him every single day? Are you coming before Jesus, praying and asking and seeking to learn from him every other day? Listen, if you want to, to weather last storm, if you want to navigate through last storm, but you do not come to Jesus for instructions and for training, because you see, unless you come to him, you come to him for instruction, you come to him for training in righteousness every other day. But if you have come to Jesus for instruction, it is not going to be a very long before your house collapses. Because you do not know what to do. So you need to come to him on a daily basis for instructions. There's a song I used that we should sing. It says, uh, it says It's me, O oh Lord. I've come because I'm needing a prayer and an answer. You see, when, 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 in, 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 when Jesus was teaching the disciples how to pray in the mother of prayer, one of the things he said in the mother of prayer, he said, give us this day our daily bread. Now what does that say? It means that you must depend on me every day. Amen. Thank God for yesterday's bread. But every day, you must come. Now, he didn't say, give us this week, give us this day, this week, give us this month. No, no, no. He said, give us today. Tomorrow, we will come again. Tomorrow, come again. Tomorrow, come again. Tomorrow, come again. Tomorrow, come again. It's an everyday thing to go to him for instructions in righteousness. Because unless he instructs us, we will not know how to build our house, to build our lives. Unless he instructs us, we will not know what to do. So if you don't come to him, when the, when, when, when the storm of life comes, your house will fall. You know, it is amazing to me how Christ, many Christians think that they can live the Christian life without coming to Jesus for the daily bread. For the daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. You're saying, thank you for yesterday's bread. But I need fresh bread today. Amen. Because you see, the challenges you have today, you cannot deal with them with yesterday's bread. Mm. Yesterday's bread was for yesterday. Yeah. Today's challenges need fresh bread. Amen. Today's challenges need fresh function. Today's challenges need a fresh move of God. Amen. That's why we must seek God daily. He said, Whoever comes to me, we must come to him on a daily basis. Amen. We must come to him seeking him daily. Amen. Lord, I come again. Yeah. I come again. I don't know what to go. I don't know what to do. I come again. Yes, Lord. I come. He didn't say no. He has not stopped anybody from coming. He said, whoever comes to me. So don't ever think that you can live this life without coming to Jesus on a daily basis. Without performing a spiritual workout. Without building the word of God in our lives. No. We can't. It cannot be done. The storms of life. Somebody need to get this. Yeah. The storm of life, they are too strong for you. Yes, the storm, you don't even have what it takes to withstand the storm of life. You don't even have what it takes. The storm of life is too strong. 
too strong. Do you want to know why so many Christians turn away from God and reject Christ and fall so easily to temptation and sin? For most, it is because they have not come to Him. They have not come to Him. Somebody said, oh, this person was in church. But we see that they turn to something and they never came to him. Yeah. They never came to him. There's no one who comes to Jesus who does not receive instructions. Mm. And never come to him. Because Jesus daily, it is so simple, it is so important. But yet, more neglected. He says, whoever hear my word. Whoever comes to me first. So there must be a coming. Why must we come, Jesus? To receive instruction. Why must we come, Jesus? To receive breathing. Yeah. Why must we come, Jesus? To equip you. Yeah. Why must we come, Jesus? To tell you what to do. Because you got no clue to life. Amen. Amen. You got no clue. So it's important. He said, whoever comes, the first step is to go to come to Jesus. And then he says the second part. He said, whoever comes and hear, and hear, and hear. So Jesus goes on to say this, that this man does more than just come to him. He also hears what Jesus says. Amen. And there's a Greek word for saying this logos. And he said, This man hears the word of Jesus. The word for hearing is not just the sound waves that resonate or you know in our eardrums. No, they're not hearing. They're not hearing. It implies hearing with understanding and hearing with comprehension. Hearing with understanding and hearing with comprehension. And one of the, one of the most heartening things that, that that a pastor, a Bible school, or a Bible uh, 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 Sunday school teacher uh, uh, will, will, will have is if somebody who is in a congregation and you're teaching and you see their face, it doesn't even show what they're listening. It doesn't even show, you know, you can know from their faces. You can know from the faces. You know what they're listening, what they're, or some some guy the expression say, okay, make it finish. You know, they act that they hear it. They act that they hear it. But there is no understanding. There is no comprehension. There is no genuine hearing. There are benefits to reading the word of God. Even if you don't understand what you are reading, I do believe, but that is not for the, that is not a, that's not that is not a deal. Because reading with understanding is always more helpful and beneficial than reading without understanding. This is why it is advisable. And when you come to church, you come to Bible studies, you must employ all the study methods. Bring your copy book, bring your pen, bring your paper, bring your recorder if you can. Bring everything you can. That you should come to church. You have a notebook and a pencil. The expectation of taking notes causes our brain to take seriously what has been said. Because once you take a note, you are saying to the mind, to the brain, this thing is serious. A pen in the hand and a notebook on your on, 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 on top tells the brain that this is better. You better listen. You better take note. You better hear. You better understand. It says to the brain, this is important. So people come to church, they just look, stare. But when you take notes, 
you will say how important it is. So the direction the Bible gives us about life and how to interact with God and how to get to heaven and how to have good marriage and a good family are all far more important than getting directions to someone's house for dinner. Yeah. The instructions from scripture, the direction from scripture, you can be compared to the to Pastor Charles Place. Put it in the something. As a child's calling me for lunch. So we're going. You know, it's far more important than that direction. Far more important. But yet, many approach the Bible with less respect. Many approach scripture with less respect. And then they approach their shopping list with everything in them. May that not be of you. May that not be of you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. May that not be of you. Amen. That you embrace scripture. Jesus says he comes, but he hears the word. Approach the word of God, seeking to hear with understanding as the wise man does, as the wise man did. Seek. Approach the word with understanding. Now, if you don't, you are abandoning the very thing that God has provided for you to help you weather through the storm of life. Yeah. If you refuse to hear and understand God's instructions, there is nothing little else that can help you. You are already sunk. You've already sunk. And you haven't even you, you, you haven't even put on your, 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 your boots in, in the water yet. Don't think you find your way through life unless you hear and understand God's instructions in his word. So the first descriptors in, 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 in for the seven is coming to Jesus. The second is hearing what he says. And what is amazing about the second descriptive term is that it is also true of the foolish man. It is also true of the foolish man. He came. He also heard. That's why I said, all the excuses, that's not what difference he is them. The foolish man also came. He listened. He also heard. Amen? Amen. It is also true. We read that he also heard. The foolish man could very well be a Bible expert. Yeah. You could equate him to a Bible expert. He could be a seminary professor. He could be teaching the New Testament. He could be a pastor teaching the Bible week in, week out. He could be a Christian who has studied the Bible for years on end and has a whole bookshelf full of Bible studies. He has completed and the whole four cabinets of sermon notes. That would be the foolish man. So, so it's, not, it's not that the foolish man didn't know. He didn't read Bible. He didn't understand Bible. No, no, no. That's not what the first year is there. But if a man can be at a level, listen, come, listen, read, study, Get all of these. If he can be that foolish, then how foolish are we who do not even come to Jesus to hear and understand his word? That is not just foolish. If we refuse to hear and understand God's word, we are not just foolish. <laughs> it's a type of insanity we are in sin. It's, 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 it's equal to insanity we are yet in sin. Of course, that explains a whole lot. It explains a whole lot. Much of what passes for Christianity today can be called nothing less than spiritual insanity. Much of what passes today for Christianity, much of what we do can be lacking spiritual insanity. The things some Christians get into, the only thing you can conclude is that they are spiritually insane. 
this a thing to get it. <coughs> so I can give you examples of Christmas that will teach all kinds of stuff. Not biblical. You know, somebody will tell you when you come to the church and you see a feather, a man and angel have visited church. When you see a feather like a bird feather or some feather, you see it, it means that an angel has visited a church. And they teach all kinds of stuff. You know why? Because they've come, they've heard, but they're understanding. They understand it, they comprehend some. It's lacking. From a failure to hear God's word and correctly understand it. Even the fully builder hears and understands God's word. So, what is that separates the two of them? What is it that separates the two of them? What is it that separates the two of them? If even a foolish builder heard and he understand the word. Now, in, in, in the descriptive term that separates the two builders is in the term. In the term, descriptive term. Jesus said, the wise builder comes to him, hears his word, and does what he says. That's why he said, whoever comes to me, number one, come, receive instructions, hear my word and listen attentively. Listen with clarity, with comprehension. But that's not just enough. And that's what obedience is. That's why I said obedience. That's what obedience is. That's why I said obedience provide protection. Obedience provide protection. So that's what obedience is. As important as coming and hearing is. As important as coming and hearing is. Jesus emphasizes on the doing. On the doing. That's the obedient part of it. That is obedience. That is obedience that produces protection. That is the obedience that produces protection. Here is the key to weathering, to weathering livestock. You come to Jesus for instruction. You hear what he says. Then you go out and do it. You know, when, 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 when um, Abraham took his son Isaac to be sacrificed. And when they got to the, to the foot of Man Moriah, he said to the servant, he says, stay here. Why are I alive? Go here to worship. What was he saying? He was saying to them, God said something to me. I didn't even say it to my wife. I just took the boy, took the guys and brought him here. So you just wait. Why I'm going to obey what God has said. God called me, Abraham said. I went there and God said something to me. And what God said to me it is fully really important not to just have gone to what God, to the call of God. It was it's not only really important to hear what God said, but it is more important, and that is the important part I'm about to do. I'm going up to obey God. I'm going up to obey God. So Jesus emphasized on the doing. 
He said, then go out and do it. It is obedience to the word that keeps your life safe and well protected in the midst of the storm. Obedience to the word. Doing what the word of God says protects your life and keeps you safe in the midst of the storm. Let's take for example. If Noah, Noah, if Noah had heard God's warning about the flood, had no idea, and received the instruction for the ark, yeah. and Noah came right, he came to God. You always got to come. Yeah. You always got to come. Noah came, got the instruction. But where will you and I be if Noah heard God's warning about the floor and received the instruction for the ark but didn't follow the instruction? You see why this is important? Why obedience is important? Why obedience produces protection? We were protected. You and I, we were protected. Noah and the rest in the ark were protected because of his obedience. What if he had followed the instruction? Yeah, have we? Say, so God said, hey, this thing is too big. I, I can't get all this wood. Let me just get small and I'm wood. What if he decided to pitch a seal? He didn't, he didn't, he didn't paint the seal. God told him to seal the thing. Why did he decide not to do that? Noah would have sunk. Noah would have sunk along with the rest of the world. And you and I would not have been here today. So we can now go ahead and thank Noah for following on the big, not just hearing what God said, but doing what God said. Do it precisely what God said. Yes. Obedience is the key that keeps you strong in the midst of the storm of life. Look, you can do all these things you, you know you can do. Listen, if, if you're not walking in obedience, you're not protected. It is obedience to God's word that Jesus illustrates in Luke 6 48, he says, The one who does the word of God, that one is like one who builds his house on the rock. Just there are just as there are descriptive, three descriptive terms here also. There are three descriptive terms for the man. So such a person, Jesus said, he's like a man who built his house on the rock. So there are three things you gotta do in building. You gotta dig, you gotta lay the foundation, you gotta dig, lay the foundation, and then build the house. You gotta dig, lay the foundation, and then build the house. There are three descriptive for the man. Who built? There were three descriptive. Come here and do. It's not just important to come. It's not just important to hear. But it's more. I mean, what what use would it be if you were a student going to school? What the essence of going on on the campus every day, every morning, go for lectures? And never did assignments. Yeah. What is important? You came to church, you, you, you went to school, you sat in the lecture, but never did assignment. Never did assignment. Never took exam. Going to the school is important. Going to the lecture is important. But doing what you heard. That the one that gives you a pass. Hallelujah. That is the one that gives you a pass. 
That is what that promotes you. In the same way, Jesus said, The man who hears, who comes and hears, and do them. Before the construction of his house, he digs deep. Then he lays the foundation. The progression is in the digging. The laying of foundation, then he builds the house. So what is the deacon aspect here? What is the deacon aspect? The builder first has to dig deep. Sometimes digging deep is downright boring. <coughs> it's very boring. You know, you got to use the energy and dig is very boring. And takes lots of time and effort. But it is very important for the construction. Yeah. It's very vital for the construction. Sometimes, the things God asks you to do, you and I to do, they're not going to be real. They're not fun. They're not just, they are not flashy. In fact, when God asks you to do something, it doesn't trail you. No one makes, you know, it doesn't make any headline. Mm -mm. Probably no one even notice what you're doing. Sometimes you're doing something for God. No. Maybe people will even criticize you that you don't seem to be accomplishing anything. Once you are on a mission for God. But well, don't let the comments dissuade you from digging deep. Don't, don't let the comments dissuade you from digging deep. Mm -mm. Don't let people pressure you into building up too fast. Pressurize you into building too fast. Do the needful. Dig the foundation. Dig deep. Dig deep. And before you can improve your life, you must have to get, you must have to, to destroy the way it was. Before you can ever improve your life. You gotta destroy what it was. That bad habit in your life, you gotta get rid of it. You gotta dig it out. You see, and I'm talking about building our lives now. When you're building your life, you gotta dig for the foundation. But when you pull it out of that foundation, is the things that hinders you. It's the bad habits of the life. You gotta dig it out. The sin, the roots that run deep, you gotta dig it out. You gotta dig it out. You gotta get a bulldozer and tear it down. All those builders of wasted time that get in the way. Of spiritual progress, you gotta remove them. You gotta remove them. You gotta remove them. This, the first step in doing what Jesus says, before you can add good elements to your life, you need to get rid of the bad. You must repent of the sin, turn from your sin, purify your life. Only when you dig deep. In the soil of your life. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of the things are buried deep in the soil of our lives. Mm. Only when you dig deep in the soil of your life. Mm. And remove all the barriers. That bad, that, that, that have been in a way for so long. Then you can be able to lay the foundation. You see, you can't build on the old stuff. You gotta dig. Dig deep in your life. Take the shovel. Go bad elements. 
take them out. Those things that hinder your progress, take them out. Those things that delay you, take them out. Those sinful attributes, take them out. That sin nature that's so rooted, take them out. You see, you got to dig so deep. Now, digging is hard. It takes hard. It takes enough effort. But sometimes it can be boring. But that is the best thing to do if you want to lay a solid foundation. Want to lay a solid foundation? You got to dig deep. This is the second step to the building process. Then you can lay the foundation. After the hole is dug, you dug deep into your life. You dug deep in on earth. All those things that took you root, all those evil, you dug deep. Now after the hole is dug and the obstacles are removed, the challenges are removed, the hindrances are removed, the sin that so easily entangles are removed, the bad habits are removed, then the foundation can be laid. In 1 Corinthians 3 11 says that no foundation, no other foundation can be laid. Other than that which has been laid, which is Jesus Christ. Oh, but see in Luke 6 28, it says that the foundation is laid upon the rock. The foundation is laid upon the rock. Now we also know that the rock is Jesus, that Jesus is the rock of our salvation. He is the cornerstone upon which the church is built. Amen. He is both rock and our foundation. Yes, Lord. He is rock that was already in the ground. Yeah. He is a rock that was already in the ground. Amen. It was laid there by God. Yeah. You do not, you, 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 you do not lay down the rock. It was already there in the first place. Hallelujah. You didn't let the rock that was already there. It is the pure, untouched, virgin rock, material deep in the earth. Hallelujah. And when the foundation is laid, it, it becomes one with the rock. Yay. You see, you, 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 you take it. It, 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 look, it looks as for the end, it says, the building is on the rock. And Jesus is the rock. So when the foundation is laid, the foundation becomes one with the rock. Hallelujah. But the foundation is something that you have to lay on top of the rock. So how do you lay the foundation which is Jesus onto the, onto the rock which is Jesus Christ? You do it the same way. And you do it with the house. You take the concrete. Ah, some people know. I have a lot of you don't know about it, but I know Pastor Jas can, can attest to it. I know uh, our evangelist can attest to it. You know, but but you you, you when you have to lay the foundation, you got the mortar. Mm. You got the mortar, you mix it, the cement, the sand, it, and you and you, and you miss it. So you first take the concrete, <laughs> and then you pour it into the hole that you dug. You take the concrete and put the concrete into the hole that you talk or into the in, 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 into the into the form that you lay in digging the hole you remove certain things from your life there's certain things in laying the foundation as you are digging through your life there's certain things that will be removed certain things will be removed from your life Now, you fill those things with Jesus. Hallelujah. The water. You fill, oh my goodness, you fill those things with Jesus. Yeah. Where you used to watch maybe television. I'm just giving an example. Right? I'm, I'm not saying don't watch television. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? So, so where you used to watch television, fill that time. Anyway, reading about Christ. Hallelujah. Yes. Where you used to go?
go an extra half an hour, fill that time reading the word of Christ. Amen. Where you used to go an extra half an hour sleep, you spend that time meditating on the word of God. Amen. Where before you love to talk on the phone, now love talking with Jesus through the word of God. Amen. You got to fill in. Yes. You got to fill in. Yes. As you lay the foundation, as you take it off the dirt, take it off the heatness, take it off the heatness, take it off all those things that block it, you got to fill it in with the mortar. Yes. You got to fill it in with the concrete. Yes, you you got to fill it in with the concrete. Yes, Listen, if you're not filled the hole with Christ, things will end up worse than they were before. Remind Luke 11, Jesus talked about his story, you know, um, is, uh, of, 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 of when an evil spirit leaves a man's body, he wanders a while and, and, and then decides to see whether the body is still used or inhabited. And when it comes and it leaves it, that nothing there, he finds everything empty and clean, but uninhabited. He said the, the spirit goes and five, seven others so, uh, come back. back. More weakened than it was. So if you if you if you lay the foundation of your life, if you dig out and you don't fill in, your life will be worse. I, I do not believe that habits and sinful tendencies in your life are the result of evil spirits. I, I know I know many people will not agree, but 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 habits. And sinful tendencies in our lives are not a result of evil spirits. But at least that, that, that's not what this, this, this teaching says. That's what the teaching of Jesus says. The point is that when you have a bad habit or a sinful tendency in your life, you got to dig it out. You got to dig it out. You got to dig it out. That's what you do. You got to dig it out. You got to confess, repent, and better fill that hole with something else, or things will soon get worse than they were before. You see, you'll never get rid of sin in your life unless you fill the void with Jesus Christ. Amen. You can get rid of sin if the void is not filled with Christ. I'm not talking about becoming a Christian. No, that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about sin. I'm talking about I'm talking about the sin you still have in your life even though you are a Christian. I'm not talking about becoming a Christian. I'm talking about the sin that you commit even though you are a Christian. Get rid of it. Dig it out. Uproot it. Fill that area of your life with the concrete of Jesus Christ. Love him. Learn from him. Learn him. Live with him. Let him build your life on his word. And the final step, the final descriptive process. He said that you build the house. He said you build the house. But of course you know the house that you build is your life. The house that I'm building is my life. The house that we're building is our lives. Your life is built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. It will be a good foundation. Firm, strong, solid. It is a good foundation. It is strong, solid foundation. It is built up as you follow the footprints. Of Christ laid out in the scripture. The wise builder does what Jesus says, and the storm comes. And the storm comes at the end of the story. He did what Jesus said, and the storm comes. When the flood arose, and the stream beat vehemently against that house. It could not shake, for it was founded on the rock. It was founded on the rock. Once the house was built by obeying Jesus Christ, 
It is able to, to weather the storm of life. Not because the house is strong, no. Not because the house is strong, but because it has a strong foundation. Amen. Because it has a strong foundation. I don't know what strong is in your life right now. I don't know what storm is in your life right now. I don't know what storm you, are, you have to face in the future. Maybe it might be financial storm. Maybe it might be death of somebody, a love for it, a loved one. The child. Maybe it may be a slander. People slandering you and they, you know, saying all kinds of stuff. Maybe it may be a gossip or an accusation against you, directed at you. Maybe it might be the loss of a job. I don't know what storm it will be. But the storm will definitely come. The storm will definitely come. Jesus said in this world, you have trouble. Don't think, oh no, that will never happen. It won't happen. And if you are not prepared, your life will crumble all around you. But if you build your life on Jesus Christ, the obedience, the obedience to his word, when the storm of life comes, no matter how severe it is, no matter how raging it is, no matter how, how the winds rage, no matter how the torrents walk or rain fall, no matter how high and violent the river gets, you will stand strong. I say you will stand strong. Amen. You will stand firm. Amen. Why? Not because you are so strong, but because Jesus Christ is. He is. The end of verse 48 says that the reason the house stood firm was because it was founded on the rock. The person who is obedient to Jesus Christ weathers the storms of life. And the opposite is true. Whosoever is disobedient reveals that this, those who are disobedient invite destruction upon themselves. Mm. I submit to you, walk in obedience. It's not, it's not just enough to come. It's not just enough to hear. But the doing is the key. The doing is the key. Jesus said, not all that said, Lord, will enter the kingdom. But only them who do the will of the Father. They say, oh, Master, your brothers and sisters are looking for you. He said, who's my brother and my sister? He said, my brother and sisters are these, those who do the will of the Father. Obedience is key. Obedience is paramount. It's not how well you preach. It's not how eloquent we are. But obedience to the word is key. Nothing will suffice. Nothing will suffice other than obedience to God's word. Because when you obey God's word, he honors his word. He honors his word. And Jesus is our perfect example of obedience. The Bible talks about Jesus. He says he was obedient even unto death, the death on the cross. And because of that obedience, so he was given a name that is above all other names. And at the mention of the name, every knee bows, every tongue confess. Every knee bowed and every tongue confess. He is an attitude of obedience. He is our perfect example. He is obedient personified. Jesus Christ. You hear him say, my meat is to do the work of my father. Hmm. The disciple comes and says, oh, maybe he found somebody to bring him food. He said, no, no, you don't understand. My food is to do the work of the father. Yes. It's obedience to him. In the garden of Gethsemane, he said, Lord, this cup is too bitter. But, but I don't really want to go through, but, but not, not my will. Let your will be done. Yes, brother. Obedience to God's word. Is key. And no matter who you are, if you will come to Jesus, you will hear his word. 
and obey what he says, you'll be like a man who built his house on the very Jesus. Who built his house on the very Jesus. Who built a house on the very Jesus. On the rock. On the solid rock. And so when the, when the torrent rains of life comes, when the storm of life comes, it will leave you standing. Don't mistake it. It's not because you are strong, but it's because of the foundation. Because of the foundation. The foundation is firm. The foundation is secure. And the foundation is Jesus Christ. I submit to you. Build your foundation on Christ. Come to him. Hear his word. Put the word into practice. Be the doer. And not the hearer. Jim says, Jim says, Jim says you are like a man. If you don't do what God says, you are like a man who comes looking in the mirror. And by the time you turn your face, you don't even know what he, what he saw. You don't even know what he saw. But let us not be only hearers of God's word. Let us be excited to us also. Hallelujah. Thank you. Oh, Father, we bless you. We give you the praise. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. We say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, mighty God. Be glorified.